This is Bump and Beyond with Yulandi Becker, the show about pregnancy and babies, 101.9 megahertz of life. You are on 101.9 Chai FM. This is Bump and Beyond and I am your host, Yulandi Becker. This show is all about parenting and we're smack bang in the middle of the holiday season. And the holiday season often brings unwelcome guests, stress and depression. And it's no wonder. The holidays often present a lot more demands. Cooking meals, shopping, baking, cleaning, entertainment, lots of family, lots of friends and lots of pressure. With the summer holidays come an increased rate of suicide deaths. Mental health is important no matter what time of year it is. However, with summer holidays around the corner or smack bang in the middle of it, it's particularly prudent to look after one's mental health. A study that was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health found that suicide rates tend to increase over this holiday season. Suicide deaths were more prevalent in South Africa in December and January. And the study suggests that changes in social activities and the possible influence of the festive season may increase the risk of suicide. When we consider the statistics of mental health in South Africa, in fact in the world, (laughs) it becomes very apparent that mental health requires far more focus and understanding. We need to educate ourselves and those around us to dispel myths and assumptions about mental health-related issues so that we can better treat them and support those who are suffering. Add to this whole holiday season a new baby. (laughs) Adjusting to parenthood isn't easy. There are easy parts. You get a hang of changing a diaper and burping a baby. But caring for a baby can be tiring at times, extremely challenging. And learning to take care of a newborn means adjusting to a new lifestyle and learning a completely different set of skills. Many moms have moments when they feel overwhelmed or even doubt their ability to take care of their baby. These feelings are very common. And with support and encouragement can often be overcome. However, sometimes the experience can start to become unmanageable and may be an indication of something a little bit more worrying. One in three South African mothers suffer from postnatal mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety and trauma. These conditions are serious and not only have an impact on a mother's ability to cope with motherhood and life in general, but research has shown that these conditions can have a detrimental impact on a baby's development. And this is what the show is about today. The topic for today is postnatal depression, and I'm looking forward to just now sharing some of my own experience personally and with friends, but also obviously talking to an expert about this because I am not, about talking with clinical psychologist Samantha Williams about this exact topic, postnatal depression. I remember with my first child, um, I was, I had the euphoria of motherhood. It was fantastic. I really loved it. But with my second one, the lack of sleep really you know, got me down. It was something... I, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't have predicted how bad it was. And um, now looking back, I realized it wasn't even close to postnatal depression. It was just a, a, a serious case of baby blues. But I am looking forward to also explore this with Samantha Williams. This is Bump and Beyond with Yulandi Becker, the show about pregnancy and babies, 101.9 megahertz of life. If you've just joined us, you are on 101.9 Chai FM. I am Yulandi Becker, you're on Bump and Beyond, and I have the privilege today to speak to clinical psychologist, Dr. Samantha Williams. <laughs> Not yet. Um, I was mentioning earlier that I am, yo, um, I've had a very different experience with both my children. 
in in the start of motherhood with my first child i was in the euphoria of motherhood and it was you of course sometimes feel overwhelmed and stressed out and all those things but it was very manageable and then my daughter came and i had a i call it the um, parenthood guilt 2.0 <laughs> because it was on a level that i have never experienced before um and i actually s- struggled to bond with my daughter the first three months Lack of sleep definitely added to this situation a lot. And I resented her. I just felt that she was taking time away from my son, in essence. And now I feel guilty about that. But anyway, that's a whole different other conversation. But once I started sleeping better, that was around four months. She was around four months of age. I started sleeping better. Those feelings went away. And then I realized, yes, it was in the pits of despair, but this was, for lack of a better word, normal baby blues and not really postnatal depression in essence, I think. But that's why we are talking about it with clinical psychologist Samantha Williams. Thank you so much for joining me, Samantha. Hi, Yolandi. Thank you so much for having me. It is great to have you because this is, as I mentioned, a very important topic. I have friends very close to me who suffer from depression and anxiety, and I'll get into a little bit more detail with that. But it is, I feel, if you know how you feel about it, it helps. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if you have this, if you've been diagnosed and you know that you have anxiety, you have depression, it helps. And also as a friend, I feel a lot more empowered to know how to deal with the situation. And this is why I want to talk about this today is exactly that. So that people are informed and that they know that it is not something to just think yourself out of. Um, I often say that with there's a difference feeling depressed and having depression. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a difference between feeling anxious and having anxiety. Mm. And personally, I know that it is a real thing. If I just think of my own, and once again, I do not have depression. I do not have anxiety. Um, and for me personally, if I, for instance, if it's if before I have my monthly period, I feel a little bit anxious that time. And I feel really, I just wake up in the morning and I feel sad and I feel angry and there is no reason for it. <laughs> and I, luckily my thinking brain can take over my emotional brain and that's the reality. I can mm. then remind myself that in a couple of days I'm going to be feeling better and then I always think imagine this is my every day Mm. (laughs) so let's start off with the question as I mentioned I definitely had baby blues you gave me a little bit of a look though when I was mentioning (laughs) that what is the difference between just baby blues and postnatal depression so baby blues like you said is pretty common i think most women go through it in fact most fathers go through it as well oh yes very interesting so we should also talk about them we shouldn't exclude them yes absolutely i think they're just as important um and what happens is you know when you are pregnant your body floods with all these amazing feel-good hormones to help your body adjust to housing the baby and giving birth and once you give birth and once that placenta leaves your body those hormones then just disappear they just like get sucked up like a vacuum and then your body is left feeling completely empty and drained and and not knowing what to do with itself And in essence, that's the baby blues. You feel sad, you feel tearful, you feel anxious, you're tired, you're overwhelmed. And generally, that should last maybe about two weeks, a little bit longer. But if it persists beyond that, if it persists into months, then you're possibly looking at a postpartum depression. Oh, And I mean, it's very interesting how you're mentioning all these things. And, And this is for me, to be honest, one of the things that... I don't know, an observation, let's call it that, that I've had with regards to any mental health issues is that often people perceive good mental health as being calm and placid and, I don't know, in control Mm. all the time, where in fact you should be 
anxious when there is an anxious situation ha- happening. You should be sad when something sad happens. You should be angry if someone punches you. <laughs> that is the reality. So good mental health is actually having the appropriate response in the appropriate situation and not having. So having a new baby, it is normal. Like you said, mm. to feel anxious mm. because you've never, I mean, look at how all of us reacted in COVID. Some were like having the time of their life <laughs> and having, and other people were really stressed out because yes. we've never experienced this situation. So we should be feeling anxious mm. when we have, because we are taking care of a baby. Mm. <laughs> it's a huge responsibility and it is. It is. It should provoke anxiety, yes. and that. But like you said, when it becomes to a situation where it's m- months on end. So, are you saying that my observation of months? I fa- I really I felt in a very dark place for at least three four months. So, how long how, is that then considered? And I mean, to be honest, it was stressful. Mm. Um, I, I had thoughts of hurting my child. I can tell you that. And instead of hurting her, because she wasn't sleeping, mm. it was frustrating. Mm-hmm. And instead of then doing something to her, I actually scratched my arm. <laughs> and that's serious. It's mm-hmm. now I can think back and I mean, it's, it's, it mm-hmm. sounds insane, to be honest. But that's how I felt. I, instead of doing something to her, I did something mm-hmm. to myself because I just needed to do something. And you're saying that is actually signs of postnatal depression. Now I know that I had valid reason. And that's the second thing I want to get to now as well is, isn't that it also for me that um, sometimes we look for a reason that some these things happen. And is that right? I don't feel that it's always the reasoning is not, you know, Lots of people think that, oh, you must have done something like this and you must feel depressed because you were abused. When Obviously, mm-hmm. if you had abuse as a child, it can lead mm-hmm. to. But people are always looking for a reason mm-hmm. why someone has. Is it always the case that there is a, a reason that something must have happened to you now you have postnatal depression? There usually is always a reason mm. for it, but not necessarily the kind of reason that you are talking yes. about. It doesn't always have to link back to some childhood trauma. It could just be the hormonal imbalance that happens with pregnancy and birth. And it is a lot of hormones. Like I said, mm. even just if I have PMS, the amount of hormones that happen, imagine when you have... Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and throw in that lack of sleep. And and you feel like you're going insane, yes. you know. Um, and sleep is a massive factor in in anxiety or depression or postpartum depression um, and suicide because sleep plays such an important role in our biology and in managing our moods. Um, and just keep in mind, Yolandi, that if you have had postpartum depression, you're at a higher risk for getting depression and anxiety later in life. I mean, I'm. In, I feel in general, I am a little bit of a stress person. That I have to say, um, but again, with age, I don't know if it's with age. I know this about myself, and I create. And I'm looking forward to talking about this as well because I do feel as well with this. Are you? There are tools that you can have mm-hmm. that you can manage it, mm-hmm. where you can help your thinking brain. I'd like to talk about the thinking and the emotional brain. <laughs> That you can help your thinking brain to control your or mm. control mm. your emotional brain so that it doesn't completely take over. And I'm looking forward to talking with you about that as well. This is Bump and Beyond with Yolandi Becker, the show about pregnancy and babies. 101.9 megahertz of life. You are on 101.9 High FM. This is Bump and Beyond, and I'm your host, Yolandi Becker, and we are chatting with clinical psychologist Samantha Williams about postnatal depression. In general, I think also, let's not just focus on the postnatal depression, because I do want to later, maybe if we have time, segue a little bit into children as well. But 
what are we've now talked a little bit about the causes and the hormonal imbalances that happen when you have a child um, that causes postnatal depression. How long does it go? Until when? Because you also mentioned you're at higher risk later for anxiety and postnatal or depression if you've had postnatal depression. But up until what point does it still, after you've had given birth, does it still is it still considered postnatal depression? It can last for years. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> if if it's left untreated, it can last for years. Mm. I mean, I remember I had a lovely young lady. I think she must have been. It was eight years since she had her baby, but because it had been gone or left untreated, it persisted for eight years. That's that is yeah, and I mean again, if I just again imagine what that must feel like every morning. What? But let's talk about that. What are the signs and the symptoms of postnatal depression? So pretty much, if you look at what we discussed in terms of the baby blues around feeling sad, feeling weepy, feeling tired, overwhelmed, anxious, not sleeping. Um, If that persists, like I said, for a longer time, and if it's more intense, intense in such a way that it affects your functioning, it affects your ability to think. You can't think clearly. You can't think rationally. Um, It affects your concentration and your attention. It affects your... Um, daily functioning in terms of just your self care. Mm. You know, I've I've seen mothers who struggle to just go and have a shower. It, and it, I've had that. I for sure mm. have had that. Even ugh, there's lots of um, little things. If I now look back, it's already a while ago. Luckily, I forgot lots of the things. But it is like not wanting to do certain things. Mm. That's also it for me. It wasn't even that sometimes I did stuff, but I didn't really want to. It was kind of going through the motions. So that lack of energy, that lack of motivation and drive and feeling, if it's, if it's quite severe. So what they found is that postnatal depression, there's varying degrees of it in terms of intensity. If it's severe, you can get to a point where life feels pointless. Actually, yes, you know, and when life is pointless, you don't want to do anything. You don't want to care for your baby. You don't want to care for yourself. You don't want to engage with other people. You withdraw completely from people. You isolate yourself. Um, And then you can get thoughts of suicide and self-harm. Like you said, thoughts of harming your baby, harming yourself. And then, you know, okay, this is serious. I need to get help. That's now easy to say this is serious. This is you know, I need to get help, but I feel that's one of the problems with any kind of anxiety, any kind of because there's such a stigma around it, and especially also postnatal depression. Because mm. I don't know for some other reasons, all moms don't we don't want to admit that we have failings. <laughs> I hope that with this show that you guys all realize (laughs) that that is a pipe dream. (laughs) That is, you should realize that there's no such thing as a perfect mom. And in all honesty, I don't think we should create that. Imagine your mom was the perfect mom. Oh, that would be a milestone none of us would reach. And that would create a whole different level of anxiety. But... That's the problem is, is because it's such a stigma and because you're in this hole of darkness... Mm. And I'm going to give the example of, because I'm also a sleep consultant, we help with moms who are sleep deprived. So I do think on average, we do deal a lot more with moms who have, or parents who have postnatal depression, not a lot more, but we do see it quite regularly. It is a difficult and sensitive Mm. topic. You can't just go to someone and say, hey, you have postnatal depression. Most people will immediately become defensive, mm. immediately become angry. How how would you even, as a mom or as a partner, let's help each other here, or as a friend, how would you realize it and get the help? Before we get to what you need to do, <laughs> how would you realize it? You know, you said something very important earlier, Yolandi. You said information is key. And antenatal classes is the starting point. So while you're pregnant, you go for antenatal classes and you arm yourself with information around what 
postnatal depression would look like around what motherhood should look like. And you learn to manage your expectations. In fact, expectations is one of the causes for depression. I can, like I said, imagine that. Yes. Imagine your mom was a perfect mom. It's that exactly. expectation of being the perfect parent. We all have those expectations yes, of we what we're going to be before we, and then mm-hmm. afterwards you're like, Oh, I'm never going to, you know, not take my kid to a party with my friends. And, you know, I'm going to just, the, my kid has to fit into my life. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a kid and then you realize, well, that was a fun dream. You know, when, when, you, when you're exhausted and mm. you, you, are, you just don't have anything left in you and you still have to look after this baby and you give in, it's okay. Yes. And I do think eventually... I mentioned now, we've now established that for sure I had postnatal depression for quite a couple of months. And I myself never, I never got medication. Um, As soon as I started sleeping, in essence, I feel sleeping is medication. (laughs) There's a lot of important things that happen while we're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that by itself, I feel was, I think it was that part. And the fact that I felt empowered through the process of getting my child to sleep better. And those two, that combination of those things Mm -hmm. actually for me felt like I was a lot more in control of the situation. Mm -hmm. And and I felt better. I I mean, I guess I still have bouts of where I feel anxious and stressed out by parenthood, don't we all? Mm-hmm. Um, but what is the treatment that we should be looking at for postnatal depression? Once we've now realized it's happening mm-hmm. or you've seen it in a friend, what what's the treatment for postnatal depression? So, So once you are able to communicate to the person... And they are able to have insight and awareness that, okay, maybe I'm not all right and I need help. The first thing would be to either seek out professional help, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist would then assess you and provide medication, which your GP can do as well if they are trained in mental health. And a psychologist would then do psychotherapy with you. The biggest predictor of success with mental health or mental health issues is support. If you have a good support system, you're already mostly there because that is what is most important. And you are then able to have someone around you who's aware, who observes and sees that you're not okay and who can then say to you, listen, go and sleep for a few hours. I'll look after baby. Oh. If you've just joined us, you're on 101.9 High FM. I am Yuladi Becker and I'm speaking to clinical psychologist Samantha Williams about postnatal depression and you've now mentioned if you notice that you have it and support is important of course I'm hoping that this discussion also between us is normalizing the situation a little bit and maybe you're sitting there at home thinking listen yeah I have these signs that they're talking about this is happening to me for a longer period than it should be and I think support is really a very big key. I cannot agree with you more because I have a very close friend of mine who has anxiety and depression. She was actually diagnosed with bipolar as well. And initially when she was diagnosed, it's now a while ago, I would say about three years ago, she was diagnosed and she was really, she she did attempt uh, to commit suicide and um, her mother then checked her into um, uh, like a clinic. Mm -hmm. And she was there for two weeks, and it was a game changer for Mm. her, to be honest. They got her on proper medication, and that's when the bipolar was then also diagnosed. And I have to say then, um, I mean, initially when that happened, I have to be honest that I was like, oh, my word, she has to go to a place for two weeks? Mm. It seems so, like, extreme, to be honest. Mm. And I think that is lots of people's response to it. And now I think it was lost. It was now that I think about it, it was last year over December as well. So the first time was over December and the second time was also uh, over December. So my statistics with the festive season really is true. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and she then um, with the third time uh, or the second time that it happened about two years later um, that she had, I mean, 
obviously throughout this time she was getting help she was on the right medication but then she had a very hectic I would say time where she felt very low again it mm-hmm. wasn't these on and off bouts again she felt very out of control and she herself actually started noticing mm-hmm. I'm and then I mentioned to her even before she told me I mentioned to her how are things going with you? Because you seem a little bit off. <laughs> She's my friend, so I can say things like that. I wouldn't say that necessarily to a client, but I said to her something, and she's like, you know what, I've noticed that myself, and I have checked myself into the clinic. I'm going there in a week's time. And I felt so proud of her that she actually noticed it herself, mm-hmm. and I felt a little bit proud of myself as well that I noticed it. <laughs> but... And and then she went for a week and afterwards they had to adjust her medication a little bit. After a while, you do have to look at these things constantly. And it's also a lifestyle, a lifestyle change. So mm-hmm. for her, like, she's not drinking alcohol anymore. She's not, um, she's only eating certain things. Do those things help? Let's talk about those important type of topics of, is that important that you do have exercise regularly? We know these things, hey? <laughs> We know these things. We know you need to eat right, you need to exercise, you need to manage your stress. But yet we find it so difficult to integrate it and incorporate it into our daily lives. You know, speaking of the the inpatient psychiatric clinic, the skills that patients learn when they're there, coping skills, stress management skills, self-awareness, are skills that we should have. One of the main reasons that, that we struggle with depression and anxiety is we don't have these skills. Yes, of course. <laughs> and, and, you know, we were joking about Maslow's hierarchy earlier. And right at the bottom, your basic needs are food, water, shelter, sleep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the easy things, the we easy think. Things. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the skills to manage your stress. We do live in a stressful world. And, and, and daily stressful events kind of roll and snowball and can become traumatic if we don't deal with it. And what happens is stress leads to burnout, burnout leads to anxiety, anxiety leads to depression. And that's usually the trajectory if we don't catch it in time and deal with it. Oh. And I mean, it is one thing to say now that we don't have the skills, but how do we teach our children those skills? I mean, I, I and I mean, I think it's more and more as we're becoming more aware of mental health, that we Mm. need to understand that these are important skills that we should all have. Once again, talking about that thinking brain and talking about the emotional brain. Personally, for me, when I have these bouts, and sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, like completely with illogical thinking, where Mm -hmm. I'm stressed out and I can't like kind of, and then I have anchoring techniques. Also that a psychologist taught me of how to, kind of get myself to anchor and to not spiral into this emotional Mm. hole and that's just by I'm sitting or I'm lying in my bed at night (laughs) and then I'm like looking at five things that I can see I see my pillow I see my bed I see my husband snoring I see this I see this and then four things I can hear my husband that I can hear snoring (laughs) um, crickets outside um, me um, like moving around in the bed, my heart beats. <laughs> That's how anxious I am. Things like this. And then three things I can smell. Mm-hmm. I can smell my sweat. <laughs> um, I can smell the room, whatever. Um, and two things I can taste. And I mean, this is honestly the first time the psychologist taught me this. I thought, what a dumb thing to do. <laughs> Honestly, I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's going to anchor me. And it really just kind of makes you realize the concreteness because this is such an abstract mm-hmm. thing that you are. And this is the type of tools I was talking about earlier that it 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 is possible for your thinking brain to mm-hmm. control your emotional brain. Because once again, I don't feel emotion. It's not something you control. You can't feel, you know, the, I can tell myself, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious when you go on radio. I, still, I can't be out. I'm a little bit anxious when I get here. Um, but that's because you're saying don't be anxious. And all your brain is hearing is anxious, anxious, anxious. <laughs> so let's talk about what does mental health, mental health prevention and protection look like? 
So, so a lot of the language you're using is, a lot, is around dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT, as we call it. The 54321 method, the wise brain, the rational brain um, is, is all around um, DBT. And DBT is a fantastic, powerful tool to use. Um, if we can start as early on as possible, we are setting our kids up for success in life. So, so even before pregnancy, if you prepare yourself, if you have a good, stable, wholesome relationship with your partner or your husband, that already sets your child up for success. Because marital discord is one of the main reasons for postpartum depression and also one of the main reasons for depression later on in life as well. Yes, I can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> because then you're living with conflict. Yes. So, so just to start there, start with having a good, healthy relationship. And communication. communication. Talking about when you're not happy about something or the, if you need something. My, mm. uh, personally, again, with my husband, that was one of the key things is just actually... Because I feel men are very different to women when we're thinking about that. And we, I, I'm intuitive when it comes to certain things. I feel like I know him. And mm. I sometimes am offended when he doesn't know me <laughs> as well. And that's my perception. <laughs> it's not his reality. Is, and that he always says that, it's like, you should have just told me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that sometimes we have this idea of that we because we can do it and they don't have to tell us stuff, mm -hmm. they should have that same skill. But they're not like that. We should just be telling them, mm -hmm. listen here, wash the dishes mm -hmm. and pack the dishwasher because I have the useful nipples unlike your useless nipples. <laughs> <Shame>. <laughs> what can we do? Bring the fathers into the room. Um, yes. <laughs> Women can be intuitive, but we also do make a lot of assumptions as well. And that communication then clarifies those assumptions. We're going to talk a little bit more about that just now. This is Bump and Beyond with Yulandi Becker. The show about pregnancy and babies. 101.9 megahertz of life. If you've just joined us, you are on 101.9 High FM. I am Yulandi Baker. This is Bump and Beyond, and we're having a wonderful discussion with clinical psychologist Samantha Williams. And let's talk now, husbands and communicating with them to help with this mm. postnatal depression situation, preparing for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, whenever I have these conversations, I'm reminded of that Simply Red song, If You Don't Know Me By Now. <laughs> Because that's how women feel. Yes. You know, that their husbands are just supposed to know them. But the reality is we need to communicate our needs. But we also need to be aware of our needs. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. <laughs> Often we don't. That That's very good point. <laughs> I'm going to say that I might have fallen into that trap as well. <laughs> and then, of course, it's, 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 your, it's your attachment and your bonding with your baby that actually prepares them for later in life. But I want to talk a little bit about that attachment and bonding with the baby because isn't that also with fathers now having postnatal depression? Because for my husband personally, that was also a very different journey because we have nine months basically to physically prepare mm -hmm. for baby coming. And for fathers, this is a very different experience. They don't have that feeling of the baby moving in your belly having heartburn, already a couple of struggles that you have <laughs> during the... They don't have that. They only have the complaining mom um, situation. So the bond is very different for the... Uh, or the, the opportunity for bonding, mm. let me rather say that, is very different for fathers. Is that something that could lead also that they feel a little bit disconnected that could lead to them having postnatal depression? Mm. So, so just like mothers go through this change in terms of matricense, where you become a mother, the journey into motherhood, this identity shift. Oh. You know, because I'm, I'm going from... Giving up your perceived ideas of parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> so fathers go through exactly the same thing. And yes, they do have nine months to prepare. But a lot of dads, and especially males, are visual. So when they see that baby, when they hold that baby, then it becomes real for them. 
But even before that, there, there's things turning around in the unconscious mind around this parenting journey and what kind of father am I going to be? Am I going to be a good dad? What kind of father should I be? You know, the expectations around it. And, and you know, I have had experience with dads who went through physical symptoms while their wives were pregnant and went through physical responses like a yeah, sympathy pain. Yes, there I, I didn't appreciate that, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a woman can, can often think maybe they're being mocked, but it is real. Mm. You know, if you have a deep enough connection and bond with your partner, they will be right there with you mm. on that journey. And that's also acceptable. I think it's also nice to have that, that they want that. Mm. To be part of it, because that's also maybe how we should rather see it. It's, we shouldn't see it as the annoying thing, and rather as that, you know, at least they want, they're trying to be part of this mm-hmm. experience and wanting mm-hmm. to also have that. And I think that's also very nice. But let's move now on to the children before we run out of time. <laughs> um, children are very emotional beings. Um, I often refer to like suicide hour, especially when mm-hmm. par- uh, parents are like at the wit's end. And, I often just to highlight it for parents and I say more often than not, it's because you are stressed out and you are anxious and this is filtering through to your children Um, because and they feel that Mm. they feed off our emotions Mm. and they become anxious. So if you're going to be calm and trying to create a calm atmosphere, you can regulate your thinking brain with their emotional brain because they don't have the thinking brain. Mm-hmm. Or they do, but it's not in. They start developing at yes. a later stage, so they are absolutely emotional beings. How how do we realize if our children is it hereditary anxiety and depression? Can your if you're anxious, can you create that for your child as well? So so. There's a difference between hereditary and genetic mm. component, which there definitely is, albeit a small component, versus learned behavior. Oh, okay. You're, and they do learn quite a lot from us. I can see my kids swiping very <laughs> nicely on their phones. <laughs> and, and, and that's exactly where they get their template on what kind of human beings they should be, how they should respond in situations, uh, what kind of partners should they have, what are relationships, what what is coping, how should I cope with life. Um, what is a grief reaction? I see mom or dad grieving. Now I know what a grief reaction is. So, so a lot of it is learned. In fact, most of it is learned. There, there's even research that shows that suicide as an option, as a coping mechanism, is learned as well. That's profound. That's really like, it actually shook me a little bit just now when you said that. And that is the thing is that as, if you have, as a parent, don't have the ability to cope with, and that's the funny thing for me when we talk also about emotion, often we think of sadness and we think of anger and mm. happiness. Mm. Those are like kind of the emotions if you talk about it. The reality is, is that stress and anxiety is also an emotion. <laughs> and and just saying that, I want to remind all of you that is an emotion that your children can also feel. When I, for instance, am rushed in the morning, my kids are a little bit more stressed mm-hmm. out than normally because, and I've learned, I've, I play classical music now in the mornings as we're having breakfast. I also ban screen time as part yes. of breakfast because I feel that it, adds to our children and these are habits Mm. for them that I'm not saying it's for them but it's also for me because those type of behaviors also helps me to be a little bit more calm Mm. in the morning and not to plan I'm Mm. I think I'm a planner of notes hey I think people might judge me if they knew how OCD I am with planning but planning (laughs) helps to manage your anxiety and that's okay it's compensatory behavior And you're 100% correct. Our children just bounce off our energies as well. And in as much as they are resilient beings, they don't know how to communicate their distress. And so they act out or, or they show us their distress in a behavioral way by what we call perceiving as naughty behavior. Yes. You know, not they should be feeling these things. Exactly. If we don't even have control of our feelings, how could we expect a two year old to do but it? Yet we do. <laughs> yes. Yet we do. Um, 
And, and, and responsive parenting is being aware of what your children are feeling, validating those feelings, and showing them how to manage them in a better way. Yeah. And a, a tip as well on that, um, because you mentioned also before, um, you know, like we don't self-awareness, let me rather say that, that we're not, as parents often, we're not even aware of what we want or how we're feeling mm. for that matter as well. And I remember... Um, when my kids were still in kindergarten, when we were on our way to school, we would play this game of identifying our feelings and how to appropriately respond. And I tell people this very often, and then they laugh at me, and it's like, how's a two-year-old going to... And then I think, how else am I going to explain it to them? And then we would have that, if you're happy, then you laugh and you smile. If you're sad, you cry. So we kind of were like identifying if you're angry you can shout into a pillow because I wanted them to know what it feels like and what the appropriate responses were in these situations Mm -hmm. and it was years that we were playing this game and I think it actually really did help because they know they don't punch kids (laughs) luckily not yet maybe I should have that's also one of those preconceived things that I feel like I've now put an omen on myself but these are like just helping them to understand the feelings Mm -hmm. and what the appropriate responses is and stress was also a feeling that I often talk to them and my kids still I think it's maybe a blessing I don't know I don't feel that they always understand what stress feels like. Mm. It's funny. Mm. Um, even though I've seen them stressed, my son's hands, like, and now I tell him, if your hands start becoming sweaty, because I have the same thing, mm-hmm. really sweaty hands when I'm stressed out. And I said, that's a sign of your body showing you mm. that you are stressed. If your mm. heart is beating faster, that's a feeling of that. And also, once again, your thinking brain, if you realize those things, mm. is Beautiful and powerful. What are some of the tips, though, with this holiday season before we end now? We're running out of time very quickly. <laughs> I must say, Yolandi, that is beautiful, though. That, that little game that you play with your kids is so important. The fact that they can identify their feelings and they know what it is, how to deal with it. Is, is 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 one of the greatest gifts you could possibly give them. Oh, I appreciate that. It makes me feel very proud. But um, it is very much about creating that feeling for my children because I myself, like I said, I'm a very stressed and anxious person. And I want to create independent little mm. human de- beings. But Samantha, it's been, we have unfortunately run out of time. Can you believe it? I'm going to have to ask you to come here again, <laughs> I think. Um, but it's been wonderful chatting with you and sharing my own experiences. I think it's also been uh, maybe a free session. <laughs> <laughs> Valid <laughs> giving out my feelings. It's also good to get it out. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining. I, I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is Bump and Beyond with Yolandi Becker, the show about pregnancy and babies. 101.9 megahertz of life. You are on 101.9 High FM. This is Bump and Beyond, and I am Yulandi Becker. It has been fantastic to speak to you today about creating the awareness of postnatal depression, depression, and anxiety in general. And as I mentioned to my guest earlier, um, also maybe voicing some of my <laughs> things was like my psychology session. So thank you for listening to all of that, Samantha and you. Uh, I really appreciate it. If you've missed our show today, of course, remember that it will be available on a podcast on highfm.com. This podcast and many other wonderful podcasts are available for you to listen to. So if you have some extra time during the holiday, go check out what is available and be in the know, (laughs) Um, for lack of a better word, um, for the new year coming up. Focusing on adult mental health is one thing. However, childhood mental health requires significant attention. Children with untreated or unsupported mental health concerns often become adults with untreated concerns, which can be even more difficult to support. Addressing mental health with children not only helps us support concerns when they arise, but we can also help influence generations to be more caring, understanding and supportive of mental health. 
prevalence rates of children or childhood anxiety and depression have seen a steady increase over the past several years. Unfortunately, it often seems that because this relates to children, it has received less attention. Often we hear comments related to children being too young to be considered uh, having mental health illnesses and that children these days are too spoiled and entitled. The reality is that our children are dealing with a far more than we had to deal with when we were growing up. We live in a world that is expecting so much of our children and they are just not ready for it all. And we see the impact of this as they grow older. Childhood anxiety and depression conditions are rising particularly quickly. So we need to better understand them and what we can do to help address them. First and foremost, we need to understand where they come from and how they develop. Often when we think of good mental health, we perceive it as being stable and, um, and calm. The is in, in essence, you have to remember that this is in essence, if you don't have the right appropriate response for these situations, you should be angry <laughs> when something angers you or something. You should be sad when something sad happens. If you're calm and stable in these situations, that's actually the definition of a psychopath. <laughs> Just FYI. So you want your children to feel emotions. You want them to be angry. You want them to be stressed and actually not bottle up these emotions. Join me next week. It's been wonderful, first of all, to have spoken to you about this very important topic. Next week, please join me in preparation for back to school. As I chat to social worker, play therapist, and mom of two, Elsa Struvig, about separation anxiety and how we can deal with back to school. So I'm very excited for that. A mother cannot support her family well and be expected to take care of others well if she is not first taking care of her own emotional and mental health. None of us know the best combination of things to do for our children, for them to become great. More often than not as parents, we just close our eyes and hope for the best. Some might call this faith. Thank you for joining me. Until next time, enjoy your day.